Next speaker is Joe Kirschfink. Is he here? Yeah. Oh, there you are, okay. Um, I, I know Joe less well than the uh, other speakers, but he does have a local connection uh, since he received his PhD at Princeton. Um, from Princeton, he moved uh, to the faculty at Caltech where he's been uh, since then. Uh, he's made a, a wide range of fundamental research contributions uh, to geology and biology, um, most of them loosely connected to magnetism. Uh, he discovered bacteria that are sensitive to uh, magnetic fields. Uh, he discovered crystals of magnetite in uh, human brains, although uh, uh, it appears, unfortunately, that we're less sensitive to the Earth's magnetic field than the bacteria are. Um, he was the first to identify uh, magnetofossils, uh, and he's argued that these could be the source of the magnetization of some, some sedimentary rocks. Uh, he was one of the principal advocates uh, for the idea that Earth was covered by uh, glaciers for one or more periods uh, six or 800 million years ago, and in fact is responsible for the term snowball Earth that most of you will have uh, heard from. Uh, he recently received the William Gilbert Award uh, from the um, um, American Geophysical Union. Um, the award described him as a, a gadfly working at the uh, edge of the crowd while the crowd chases after him. But uh, of course, the citation was deliberately ambiguous as to why the crowd was uh, 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 chasing after him. Uh, Joe. There are five or six major things in uh, the evolution of life which are important. And the biggest is the origin of life. After that, you would say the adaptation of the molecular oxygen, the origin of the eukaryotic cell, the origin of animals, and then the nature of mass extinction events, and finally humans. Uh, wh what have we done? Uh, so the origin of life is a biggie. Um, and what I would like to suggest today is we've been looking at the wrong place for it. Virtually the entire literature on um, origin of life assumes that it began on Earth. Now it says it's going there, but um, we'll get this straight here in a second. I've got movies that would not work on my other uh, things. So, um, geez. Uh, so to kind of give it, while this is going on, I'll give an overview of what I'd like to talk about. Um, a few years ago, we made a discovery on one of the Martian meteorites, ALH 84001, um, that it had a magnetiza magnetization pattern within the rock um, that suggested it had, uh, that Mars once had a very strong magnetic field. Uh, but when we analyzed that more carefully using a, a very sensitive magnetometer uh, scanning magnetic microscope, uh, that was built at Vanderbilt and University of ACA by John Woodsworth's group here, uh, we were able to show that uh, it had never been heated even to 40 degrees Celsius in its entire life. In other words, from the surface of Mars four billion years ago through an ejection event in space about 15 million years ago. Oh, there we go, we got it. Um, so it, let's see, uh, it, it made its way to Earth. Now, maybe we have it. Okay, great. So uh, the title of my talk then is Boron Ribose in a Martian Origin for the Terrestrial Biosphere. And again, I'd like to thank funding agencies over the years that have uh, allowed us to do it. And I'm gonna try to use my little pointer here. Can everybody see that moving around? I think it'll work better than a laser pointer perhaps. So anyway, thanks to all the support from Agron, NIH, NICDR, et cetera, et cetera. And more recently, the Earth Life Science Institute at the Tokyo Institute of Technology. So here's the, another connection to <laughs> Freeman. Uh, Origin of Life, uh, second edition, 1999 to 2004. And Freeman came up with a, a solution to this problem that prebiotic chemists had, had about the uh, origin of ribose. And the idea that Freeman came up was, well, the uh, problem is I'll get to with ribose is that if you try to make it inorganically, it forms a coal tar. And Freeman suggested that perhaps you could, well, get the metabolism first, let the cell start running, b do it in a garbage bag of some sort, you can get, make little lipid bags, and that would protect it, you could get the ribose to go and so forth. Uh, 
And then at some point, the, when the RNA did get started and evolved, you would get a parasite to come in. Uh, viruses are kind of fun things in particular. Uh, you would then get a collaboration between the parasite and the metabolic creatures. And then eventually the RNA would kind of take over. You'd start getting Darwinian evolution. Uh, that would lead to multicellular organisms and us. And uh, item seven here I really like best is whatever happens next. And I assume by that you meant the high frontier expanding to space with a wonderful concept. I would like to challenge that a little bit because I, re oh, because I, I really think we now know a little bit more about ribose. When you wrote those books, 1999, 2004, et cetera, uh, ribose was a problem. I think that problem has been solved. The ribose world actually works, and the solution of that actually leads to the suggestion that we are all Martians. And so I, I think that's kind of the interesting thing. And, uh, I hate to tell you this, Raymond, but for all the poor students out there, you can get a, an illegal copy of his book from a Russian website. <laughs> anyway, so, shh. Um, I don't see many poor students out there. <laughs> anyway, uh, so I'd like to overview a little bit uh, with some time terms. It's very actually hard to find a diagram like this that shows the interplanetary extension of geological time between Earth, Moon, and Mars in particular. I'm going to be talking about the time we think the origin of life was done. That's kind of the Hadean on Earth, uh, maybe early Archean if it's that late, which corresponds to what we call Noachian time on Mars. So over here. So those are the time intervals. And then to compare Earth and Mars, well, anyway, and what I want to do is to give you a nut summary here of why I think we are Martians. Fundamental five or six things. And then I'll go through and try to convince you of this. And at the end, you'll probably convince, I'll convince you I'm a nut. But that's <laughs> the normal for this place. Anyway, uh, and, and the argument is the follow. Uh, the deep mantle of Mars has actually remained at the iron roostite buffer, redox buffer, uh, since planetary creation. That's very important because it means that the gases that would be coming out from the deep Martian mantle really mimic those used in the original Miller-Urey experiments. Earth, we realized after that, shifted away from that. Uh, <clears throat> the other interesting thing about Mars, which was poorly realized, there's very good evidence from uh, isotopic studies of the carbonates in some of the Martian meteorites that the atmosphere four billion years ago had an octic component. Something like a quarter of the atoms of water, of oxygen in the water, went through an ozone stage. And you can understand that because it had a magnetic field, and we'll get to that. And the genes escape of the hydrogen produced leaves the oxygen behind. So when Mars had the liquid water atmosphere hydrosphere, it was oxic at the top and then highly reducing gases. You have the maximum redox gradients on life. And I've argued for many years that life is going to evolve metabolically like anything else. It will start sloppy and get better. I don't think life would have evolved in an extreme environment. When we look today at extreme environments, hydrothermal vents, the organisms that can survive there evolved to that place from places where living was easier. So I don't think you're going to get it unless you have broad redox gradients. Mars had those, I'm going to argue, Earth did not. Uh, also, again, there are many minerals that we need, it turns out, to make ribose stable, particularly borate and molybdenum-6. Uh, um, and it turns out, if you have an oxic upper atmosphere of Mars and reducing gases, can you reach it? Well, it turns out Tharsis is this early formed volcano. It sticks up 12, 21 kilometers above the medium height, and then it goes down. So it's up above the scale height of the Martian atmosphere. So it's up there sitting in the aerobic zone, right where you want it to make these minerals. Uh, and Mars most likely had both deserts and a North Polar Ocean. Uh, I'll show some of that evidence. Huge chains of crater lakes. Um, it's similar to Death Valley. That's exactly where we get the minerals we need to form ribose uh, with Steve Benner's chemistry. And I've been working with Steve Benner on this crazy idea. And then finally, panspermia is possible. At least five of the known Martian meteorites now, at about 10% about of them, we know got here on low temperature, low shock trajectories in which life could rise. 
And so I'm going to actually show Freeman writing across space here in a bit. Uh, so here's actually my outline of the talk. Uh, and I'll launch in immediately with a comparison of early Earth and Mars, go to the ribose problem, and then a comparison of water on early Earth and Mars, meteorites. And I may be one of the few people still arguing that we do have some evidence for life on Mars from one of the Martian meteorites that has not been discredited yet, and we, for which we know of no other way of making it. That's this famous uh, Martian worm thing, but it's not the worm, actually. So here, first comparison. Life is here now, which is why everybody assumes it originated here uh, on Mars. We have no visible life, even the little hint of methane in the Martian atmosphere which might have been done by 30,000 cows or something, has died. So I guess we've got 30,000 dead cows on Mars now, uh, no methane. Uh, uh, Earth has a deep gravity. Well, it's very difficult to knock things off of Earth uh, without melting it. We don't know of any meteorites, say, with a fossil ammonite in it or any fossils. We don't have them. We have tectites. But on Mars, it's easy to knock things off. The gravity well is uh, shallower. It's not as deep. You can get it into space easily. Uh, and on Earth, unfortunately, the oldest rocks have been melted and buried and destroyed. On Mars, the same age rocks are beautifully exposed. So I'll tune first to this rogue meteorite, the ALH 84001. I won't talk about its source, but it's about 4 billion years old. Uh, and it's the one that is causing all the controversy. It's also the one that gave us the first Definitive evidence of a Martian magnetic field. Uh, this is a paper we published in 97. Uh, sub pieces of this meteorite are magnetized in different directions. And we could actually show that that magnetization was gained before the carbonate. And that led to the temperature constraint and the first evidence of a strong Martian magnetic field. And that's important because it stops the erosion of the atmosphere. And it's actually very strong. If you compare Earth and Mars, Earth is on the top here. And take a note of the scale of the features at the same elevation. The Martian anomalies are a factor of 10 stronger than those from the Earth. Of course, the Earth now has a main dipole, but, uh, and, and Mars didn't have an external dipole. But the evidence is when those rocks formed on Mars, they had a very strong magnetic field. It's kind of fun. Uh, and again, <clears throat> uh, that will stop the atmosphere from eroding. However, on Mars, because it's smaller, it means you get an oxic source. Ultraviolet light hits water molecules. You form ozone. Ozone cycles to oxygen. Hydrogen escapes. Um, because of the magnetic field, you block the sputtering away of that oxygen. So you leave the oxygen behind. And I think that's a critical thing for the origin of life, actually. Uh, and then getting into the geological redox buffers. Geologists love to do phase diagrams and to worry about oxidation redox states. And so I'm going to introduce a few concepts. This is log oxygen fugacity. Up here is where you would get molecular oxygen. Uh, and this is uh, logarithmically less and less uh, oxygen around. The buffers we use, you can imagine, iron woostite being down here, abbreviated IW. Uh, phthalite magnetite quartz. These are just different minerals. Magnetite's the iron, uh, Fe2 plus 3 plus oxide. And then magnetite hematite is up here. Those are the various buffers. The important comparison is planetary differentiation. Earth was melted maybe several times early on in its formation by large impacts. What that did was allow the, the metal iron to sink to the core, uh, and uh, water from the surface would then interact with it. And so when you actually go and look at the volcanic gases, you get some interesting conclusions. Uh, this is, again, the oxygen fugacity log units relative to the iron woostite buffer here. Mars, uh, is the Martian mantle has a wide variation, but it includes all the way down to below the iron woostite buffer. Under those conditions, the predicted gases coming out are exactly the type of things that Stanley Miller and Harold Urey suggested in their spark experiments. Okay? Uh, those are methane, ammonia, hydrogen, et cetera, et cetera. Earth, on the other hand, the Mantle is oxidized significantly. And this is one of the big problems in the origin of life. Because originally, Yuri and, Murray, uh, Yuri and Miller thought, um, OK, we'd have these reduced gases. And then the geologist said, now, wait a minute. The, uh, you don't get that. And that led to a couple decades of people saying, oh, how do we get 
biosynthesis on Earth when you don't have these reducing gases? Hey, those gases are coming out of Mars. So uh, that's kind of one big argument for, say, putting it back on early Mars. And then, oh, a side project here, did early Mars have lightning? Um, actually, this is the cl classic Gary Miller experiment. So here, here's this life on Mars with lightning. Uh, so question about lightning is a very interesting point. If you look at where lightning hits on Earth today, it mainly is correlated with exposed continental material and not permafrost. Lightning does not like to strike on ground that is frozen. Why? Gee, it's an electrical con uh, insulator. Lightning needs to conduct, and so it, it doesn't like to do it. But also, if you notice, lightning doesn't like to strike on water. And in fact, in those rare cases where it does, it usually hits something that's floating in the water like a boat. Okay, so uh, <coughs> it's interesting. So one of the things we want to do on Mars, in fact, we're gearing up the call for instrumentation has just come out for the Mars 2020, ro 2020 rover mission. Uh, we wanted to put a flux gate on the next Martian rover to actually see if we can find lightning strikes. And the reason we can do it is that lightning strikes are immortal. And they, where lightning is struck, it leaves a fingerprint, it remagnetizes the rock. The lifetime of that magnetization is longer than the age of the universe, it's single domain uh, materials. And in fact, a typical lightning bolt makes an anomaly about a meter scale sh sharp thing. You could pick it up with a compass or with a flux gate. So what we're hoping to do, oh, oh, there's another neat thing. Where lightning hits, it also turns phosphate into phosphite, which is a critical way of getting the phosphorus into the nucleic acids that you need to form RNA and so forth. So what we want to do is put a little uh, flux gate sensor on the next Martian rover, and we'll see if NASA is wise enough to let our instrument go this time. Uh, so I'm going to get into the ribose uh, again. Uh, there's uh, several syntheses that have been discovered in the last decade. I'm going to focus on the one that's most plausible geologically, and that is Steve Benner's model. And of course, we've all seen pictures of the primordial soup, the things that you need to get to actually start producing life. You have to have organic molecules somewhere. Ribose to modern life is one of the most critical ones. It helps form the backbone of uh, uh, RNA and DNA, deoxyribose. And so you want to actually get that. Now, the problem is ribose is very difficult to make. And this is probably one of the reasons why Freeman suggested doing it in the garbage bag. Because if you could get a, a little primitive metabolism to make it, then there, you maybe could control these side reactions that produce coal tar. Um, well, so there's actually four problems with the RNA world. It, one is the tar problem, uh, it, and I'll get to that a little bit more. There's the water problem. If there's too much water, you don't want to polymerize. Every time you put little subunits together, you remove water. That's how you string things together to make long, big polymers. Uh, that doesn't like to happen in a water world if there's too much water around. So that's why people who deal with the origin of life like deserts. So we'd like deserts. There's the other two problems, uh, the poor catalyst, et cetera, et cetera. Benner solved a problem actually with a group of graduate students at the Agaron Summer Institute back in 2003. He published a little note in Science 2004. Turns out he found a solution to stop the coal tar formation. And that involved reacting it with borate solution and with calcium. And it turns out there are two critical spots on the molecule in the synthesis. If you block it with borate and the calcium, you end up making abundant five carbon sugars instead of coal tar. And this is a little piece of uh, uh, a borate generating, uh, containing mineral culminite. Uh, Eulexite works as well. You do it uh, with that, you get nice five carbon sugars. Uh, if you don't do it, you get the brown coal tar. Okay, so and it's kind of a critical thing. But when I heard that, I said, Steve, do you realize what you've done? You've proven we're Martians. And the reason is the calcium borate minerals mainly form in deserts because the minerals precipitate from water, they dissolve from water. And the environment you want to do that in is like Death Valley. Okay. And in Death Valley places, you get culminite and ulexite. 
a uh, huge borate deposit. Remember the 20 mule team boron that would go out? Well, and so here's the deal. You need to evaluate early Earth versus early Mars based on water and the ability to get deserts. Now, actually, that's something that geologists have been working on intensively for the last couple decades. Is the water volume on Earth is interesting. There are astrophysical problems. Uh, George Darwin actually pointed out that if you measure the rate of lunar recession, the moon is moving a few centimeters away a year. If you run that backwards in time, the moon turns out to have been within the Roche limit about a billion years ago. So there's something wrong with the way the moon is receding today. And it turns out, that, and in fact, Darwin used it as a, as a means of dating the Earth, which was wrong, but anyway. Uh, the, the solution turns out to put the continents under the water and have the tidal bulge just roll over the ocean decreases the tidal friction, and it works. And it, that was the kind of the first evidence that, gee, maybe there was not much land in the past, but there's a lot more evidence. Uh, the oldest bits of the planet we have of planet Earth are tiny grains of the mineral zircon um, <clears throat> that uh, are found, this is an aerial view of the Mount Marrier, uh, Jack Hills area in West Australia. Turns out the sandstones that are about 3.2 billion year olds there have tiny sand grains of the mineral zircon. We can date those individual zircon grains with very high resolution ion microprobes. Some of those grains go back to 4.4 billion years ago. This is the Concordia diagram. The intersection is shown right up here. And those intersecting little grainlets uh, are the oldest bits of Earth that we have. Hadean Earth in there. We, actually, as I mentioned, we have some a little bit young, younger uh, terrains now. But the important thing about those zircons, when you study the oxygen isotopes, it's very clear we had oxygen, water and oxygen being subducted, forming what's called S-type planets. So early Earth, four billion years ago, had enough water to be subducted dramatically. And those heavy oxygen ratios need a significant ocean volume on the order of three to four ocean volumes from the present. Now, uh, and various analyses have uh, supported that. Uh, now, if you go back 4.4 billion years, we know that the moon formed by a huge impact it melted virtually the entire uh, mantle. Well, the whole planet was presumably melted. That's why it got differentiated. Uh, but it means the geothermal gradient is higher, the heat flow is higher, and it means you can't have high mountains. Okay, you can't get something like the Sierra Nevada Mountains or the Himalayas standing up high because it means you have a root that goes down and the thermal gradient melts that root. So there's an a priori restriction on the ability to get high continents. And if you've got several volumes of ocean water, you're not going to get it. It's, it's, it's pretty good. And even then, there's no, just in the last four or five years, there have been discoveries in northern Canada of this, no, I can't pronounce it, Nuvenatic greenstone belt, dates at about 4.3 billion years old. Those rocks are pillow basalts. They formed at the bottom of the ocean underwater, so direct evidence. And indeed, if you look at the younger rock record, we don't have any evidence of shallow waters on the Greenland sediments in issue at 3.8 billion years. Uh, we, we have pillow basalts there. We have uh, very fine, uh, banded iron stones, but these are deep water sediments. We don't have any evidence of shallow water until about three and a half billion years. Three and a half billion years, we get ripple marks and, and things. So, you know, the, maybe, maybe occasionally you had a little bit of a volcano sticking above that ocean, but, you know, that's not where you're going to get these borate minerals that you would need for ribosynthesis. And so Steve Venner took this argument and made this slide and loaned it to me. Uh, and, and that thing uh, is not an island. That's a monster chasing some, anyway. Uh, so I would say early Earth is most like a, a water world. In contrast, early Mars, we actually have the rock record from Mars. We know what it's like. Uh, Mars has a, a dichotomy in the crust. There's a north polar basin uh, and then a southern highlands. The highlands are heavily cratered. Uh, 
from the geological record of Mars. This is a slide I borrowed from Bethany Ullman, my colleague at Caltech. Uh, there, there was a wonderful ep episode around uh, the mid-Noachian time where we have abundant evidence for flowing liquid water on the surface. Mars at that time was clearly in the habitable zone. Um, and, and the data had just gotten better and better from uh, uh, various Martian rovers. Uh, or Martin, but, but I would like to make a point here. Um, we've known f since the Mariner missions that there are valley networks on Mars with what looked like flowing water on the surface. These were interpreted originally as maybe being subglacial features instead of sub but more, I think it's definitive now it was surface. But here's the thing. Uh, we know when that big pulse in uh, Bethany's chart came out. This is the Tharsis province, liquid water coming up, up through there. Uh, that Tharsis eruption is, you know, it's not just Olympus Mons being the biggest volcano in the solar system. The Tharsis province is the largest construct, the largest mountain in the solar system, basically, and the largest gravity anomaly. Very peculiar thing. The Martian, Mars apparently did not have as many heavy impacts. The upper mantle was cooler, and it solidified and became solid. Earth's mantle is convecting. We have upwelling zones, plumes, and things. Mar it doesn't happen on Mars. And in fact, when Tharsis erupted, Mars was already rigified, ri uh, uh, rigid. Uh, and it turns out, when uh, Phillips, Zuber, and the, uh, Sean Solomon and others went and looked at the, the surface structure of Mars, it turns out those valley networks go down downhill of the warping on Mars that was done by Tharsis. So you imagine you had a planet that solidified, you formed a big pimple on the side, the pimple rotated the planet to the equator, it's called true polar wander, it twisted, kind of like taking a, a ring and twisting it, and then the water flowed downhill from the twisting. It tells us something, the source of those volcanics of Tharsis Way over here, we're deep down in the mantle. That's right from the Martian core up. It means that the gas is coming out of that. Again, Uri Miller gases, deepest part of the mantle, boom. Uh, and uh, there's enough water, if you believe the Phillips uh, and Zuber analysis, one and a half bar atmosphere, 120 uh, meter deep ocean. Uh, and the gases were equilibrated, as I said, with the Martian mantle. It's exactly what you want for Uri, Uri Miller experiments. There's also a question, was there an ancient ocean? Uh, Jim Head, about uh, 10 years ago, 1999, published this wonderful paper arguing from the Mars Orbiter laser altimeter data that there were shorelines, and he actually proposed uh, that there were several, at least two major shorelines you could trace around. The perspective image he showed was beautiful. Of course, it looks better when you fill in the one elevation with water and try to keep it that way. But he thought he had these shorelines coming up. And actually what happened almost immediately, uh, various people in the geological and uh, planetary science community dumped on it, saying, well, look, if those are shorelines, they ha should have the same elevation. And it turned out if you follow those shorelines, they varied by kilometers in elevation. And that led people to say, that's not a shoreline, it's some other feature until a few years ago when Taylor Perone and others said, now wait a minute, remember that true polar wander that Tharsis did that warped it? If you unwarp that, you end up getting, uh, you restore those shorelines basically to the same elevation. The model unwarping is the red line and Perone's um, uh, other things. So he, okay, well maybe those are shorelines, okay. <laughs> Mars may have had a North Polar. And since then we've gotten abundant data from the Opportunity rover from uh, the Curiosity rovers that there's liquid water, there's hydrothermal alteration, there are these blueberries, these hematitic spheres that form. And so my argument, and this is Steve Benner's slide, uh, this is the Kirschvink solution to the Benner model is you move it to Mars and do it there. So I, I think Mars meets that criteria. It has everything we need. And then that leads to, all right, well, <laughs> if it's if life, if an RNA world, sorry, human, could <laughs> maybe form on Mars, uh, could we get it here? And 
there's actually been a fair amount of resistance in the origin of life community to this, this argument. Um, so, I don't know, well, but, so I want to say, look, uh, the idea of panspermia is something that, that has a pretty uh, <coughs> long history. <laughs> the question, could we get life from one planet to the other? And so I'm going to talk directly about, it's not just speculation, we have experimental constraints. We've got rocks that we can sit and pound on on the table that have done this. And I want to show you that it may not have brought freedom, but actually it might, well, anyway. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so here's this rogue meteorite again, ALH 84001. And a few years ago when the uh, controversy about possible microfossils came out of this, I actually collaborated with John Wisco's group at Vanderbilt, who had de developed a, a scanning magnetic microscope using a superconducting quantum interference device technology. And it, it, it is actually an amazing system. You could sit and put a sample here and scan it at resolutions of about, you know, a, a hundred micron scale and read magnetizations that we could not detect any other way. It's uh, on the order of uh, 10,000 times better sensitivity than any other technique for measuring the magnetic moments. And it was an obvious nice sample to work with. So <clears throat> we took a scan of a chunk, actually many chunks of this rock. Uh, and you can see here, uh, this is a piece of the fusion crust on the outside that was heated. You can actually see that there's a potentially magnetized zone and then a bleached zone going in. There's a heat wave that has moved in, demagnetizes the minerals in that part of the sequence. And you go in about three or four, millimeters and suddenly bang, you get a, a good record of heterogeneous magnetization. So it means the heat pulse didn't go in there. Now, when we started doing this experiment, we never dreamed we'd be talking about panspermia. We wanted to see what the strength of the Martian magnetic field was. We had actually uh, taken a rather interesting furnace to, the, to Vanderbilt to run this on that it built in my lab. But when we started looking in more detail, we started doing what's called thermal demagnetization experiments, where you heat the sample and cool it, and you measure the magnetism that's lost, then you heat it and cool it in a known field to see what it's gained. And by doing that at small steps, you can actually uh, start to measure the intensity of the magnetic field. That was the goal. But what we discovered in the lowest step we agreed on doing, I wanted to do like 70 degrees, and Ben Weiss wanted 30 degrees, so we compromised on, 20, on 40 degrees that just between the 25 and 40 degree scans, you see we lose a fair fraction of magnetization. And in fact, where these arrows like here, that disappeared. The arrows here, this feature, that disappeared. We looked up and said, wait a minute. This thing is demagnetizing at basically room temperature. And when we analyzed it more carefully, in, in fact, here, here's, a, I'm gonna show a line graph from A to B across here in the next slide. You see that you lose a huge drop to 40 degrees, and then you start demagnetizing the other ones. Wait a minute. And, and not only that, it's different grains, and they were magnetized in different directions. The only way you could have that is if those grains were magnetized on Mars, they were disrupted and rotated on Mars, carbonate formed in between, these little blebs I'll get to, and then that was taken to Earth and never heated even to 40 Celsius. If, if it had been heated, those things would have been demagnetized and gone. So the definitive proof, we had a rock on the table that had gone from the surface of Mars to the surface of Earth without heat sterilization. Our body temperature is 37 degrees. That's not enough to kill damn near anything. So almost all micro microorganisms, spores and seeds can survive at these temperatures and so forth. And <clears throat> we can now that uh, goes back. We've got four other meteorites. We've verified it with argon, argon least uh, loss characteristics, et cetera. I mean, it's, it, it's a done deal. Those rocks get there. We have five that did it. Okay. Now, the origin of life people say, now, wait a minute. You're claiming spores came in. We have a group of bacteria called terabacteria that are adapted to land, and they come out very late in the evolutionary tree. So how do you, hey, if I throw a rock with a bug in an ocean world, on Earth, and it grows, the first thing it's going to lose is things it doesn't need, like the adaptation to land. So presumably when land did arise on Earth, it readapted. So 
all these arguments really don't do it. We also know, I mean, that's, that's the one rock doing it. But there are other experiments that people have done, particularly the European Space Agency, uh, actually flew a satellite for eight years that had a life module in it. And, uh, you know, things survived, no problem. Uh, a major impact on Mars, meteorites will start raining out on Earth within nine months. Yeah, a major impact goes on Mars, it's like a shotgun going out into the solar system. <clears throat> nine months later, we start getting rocks. Some of those will be surface rocks. And maybe Freeman will write along with it. So the, the transfer of life, actually anything, bacteria, archaea, and eukaryotes, <clears throat> is a likely event. If they had been on Mars, they would be here. So, so this doubles the problem of the origin of life. Everybody was thinking about Earth. You have to think about Mars, too. It's double the problem. And it may actually have a solution. So, uh, <clears throat> and, of course, if it had evolved on Mars first and then Mars died, it would be us, and we wouldn't necessarily know it. We'd have to figure it out. But I really think that if it lives on Mars, if it's still there, it's probably alive in the subsurface somewhere, it probably shares our genetic code. I mean, it, it, it's not a dumb idea to put a gene sequencing machine tuned for the terrestrial biosphere to test to see if it's the same one on Mars. I mean, people say, well, it's independent. Well, yeah, maybe, but if this is true, it might actually be us. And we wouldn't know. So getting <clears throat> towards the end of, I got, what, another five, ten minutes here. Briefly, ancient life on Mars. Uh, this is the thing that triggered all the debate. Uh, is that a Martian? You know, this worm, I, I don't really know. <clears throat> if you go back to the original McKay paper, they had four lines of evidence for life on this meteorite. And, and you know, the funny thing is, a good biomarker is something that is difficult to do inorganically. This is Andy Knowles' law. Okay. And so I, you want to find something that's difficult to make inorganically if it's going to be a good biomarker. Uh, the one that has not fallen is this possible bacterial magnetofossil claim. That was in the original McKay at L press conference at the White House in the paper. Well, so I'm going to talk about magnetite in a little bit because actually this one claim has never been shown to be possible inorganically. So it's still a viable biomarker. Um, th these are magnetotactic bacteria. They mineralize uh, intracellular crystals. They're, we know the genome. We, we know them all over the place. The magnetosomes are, are beautiful. They're all over the place. They're intricately engineered devices, nanoparticles made biologically. Uh, they are also not just in bacteria, as was introduced there in the uh, in salmon, the magnetoreceptors there in the human brain. This is that famous crystal fragment of the uh, the cerebellum magnetosome that Atsuko imaged so beautifully. Since then, we know the actual cells in animals. We're getting a handle on the actual magnetic sense organ. Uh, there's a structure in the edge of these one cell in a million where you have uh, about a micron-sized organelle that uh, uh, has thousands of magnetosome crystals. You can actually image them in the, in the back uh, with the confocal imaging. You can actually see the reflections. Uh, you can actually uh, do confocal reconstructions and actually see the magnetosome crystals reflecting relative to the membranes. Uh, and to be really fun, you can, spin, you can extract the cells and spin them and you can actually see them. Do you see the spinning cell here? Freeman, you have those in your head. <laughs> Absolutely. And I know you do because we shot you to prove it. Anyway, uh, but similar crystals seem to be present in these carbonate blobs. Now, an interesting feature about this Martian meteorite is that it, on the fracture surfaces, ALH84001, there are these weird pancakes uh, of carbonate up to 200 microns across with rims, and in thin sections, it's kind of neat, you get the various uh, carbonates. There are magnetites scattered throughout those carbonates, some concentrated in little bands here. And after the McKay et al. paper came out, the claim had been made that these magnetofossils were present in there, and I had discovered no magnetofossils. And in fact, one of my former <coughs> collaborators, Hodrotola Valley, was on the original McKay et al. team. And so, of course, we brought them and looked at them, and damn it, you know, when you extract the magnetite from those particles and look at them, when I first saw it, I said, oh, come on, that's from the South Atlantic. 
It's a, it's a marine sediment. Those are, and I said, no, no, this is Vermont. Then you look at it, and all of our friends, the, the red arrows turn out to be clear inorganic crystals. They have chromium and aluminum anomalies. But the ones with the blue arrows started to show up our favorite friends. And these elongate magnetosomes with the hexagonal morphologies. And you know, you scratch your head and you say, oh my gosh, the modern bacteria make things that look like this. And here are the same things from this Martian meteorite. Okay. And there's an industry that's been trying to do that for 60 years. It's called the ferrite industry. They've tried to make the little magnetite crystals grow preferentially in one direction versus the other. Cubic crystals don't like to do that. Their surface free energies are hard. The bacteria cheat. They do it in a membrane. But you can actually identify seven criteria that are biological fingerprints on the growth of these magnetite crystals that are difficult, not impossible, but difficult to do inorganically. And the Martian magnetites certainly do six of those. Um, and in fact, uh, the one thing that is still controversial about the Martian is, is whether they're in chains. I mean, everybody agrees this is. The controversy is, can you do s these six inorganically? People have tried decomposing carbonates that had a little, a little bit of iron in it. But when you do that, it turns out the magnetites that are formed are not chemically pure. The Japanese have a beautiful wastewater purification system that involves growing magnetite in water, and it sucks out cadmium and uranium and all, anything else that's in, in the water, and it goes into the magnetite. And yet, these Martian magnetites are pure, despite being in carbonate that's a garbage bag of, well, elements, not <laughs> organic molecules. Um, and, 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 but, but so there, there, is a, there is a solution. Emery Friedman, who was a superb microbiologist, studied these carefully and thought the Martian particles did have chains. You can actually see the red arrow here pointing towards that. But it, he, it, wasn't, it wasn't totally clear. He saw strings. He couldn't really prove they were in situ and so forth. And uh, it, what we really need is to be able to image those things. So I'm going to propose something that I think we can do now at this Earth Life Science Institute at uh, Tokyo Tech. Uh, the carbonate blebs actually occur on the silicate minerals. You can actually see the carbonate. They're thin little pancakes up to about 10 microns. But there are new techniques that exist. And Atsuko's lab at uh, uh, Tokyo Tech with Kei Hirose has just installed one of these super duper focused ion beam milling machines where we can think we can go and actually slice through. And uh, you should be able to do, with five nanometer steps, should be able to go through some of these things if, if they're really there and get like 500 voxels per magnetosome but then three-dimensionally spaced to be able to see if those are in strings. The probability of randomly grabbing these particles and having clumps or strings of particles all the same size can be calculated. Just, just you know, what's the probability of sampling that distribution of things? So we can actually test statistically, quantitatively, the idea that these things are non-random distributions. If they're non-random, presumably they're biology. We can also do synchrotron magnetic techniques. There's a whole variety of other fun stuff. So I want to conclude here by going through some of Steve Benner's logic. It's kind of fun. Uh, and then I'm going to show, show, just for Freeman, a surprise, how we know that we really have a trace of the Martian biosphere with us. So anyway, here's Benner's RNA logic. Uh, borrowed this from Steve Benner's talk at the Goldschmidt conference. If it's RNA first, yes or no? If it's no, there are different problems. And you have got a garbage bag or something coming in. If it is RNA first, then you need to make RNA prebiotically. If you use Benner's stupid chemistry, those are Steve Benner's words, not mine. Uh, no, then you have to get your own alternative. Go find your own way, okay. If yes, then you need oxidized minerals in the desert, okay. Can we have these in early Earth? If no, then we're Martians, okay. Now, I, I modified Benner's thing a little bit because I'm an advocate. <laughs> if you can't have it on early Earth, well, we still could be Martians. I mean, come on. So it's a possibility, all right? <laughs> and so, but to expand that to more planetary perspective, where could life have evolved? I tend to be a little bit of a skeptic. And I agree with, with Freeman that if you really want life to expand, you should engineer it to do the things that you would like. Although I'd like to talk to you about your 
greenhouse plant a little bit. I'd like to see the heat flow calculations and the energy budgets and things of that sort. But uh, anyway, if we worry about four main possibilities, Earth-like planets, Mars, Europa, meaning an ice-shielded world, maybe Enceladus as well, maybe extrasolar, H2-rich super-Earths, which have been mentioned here. You can get liquid water on the surface of some of those. Well, water would be in all of those. That defines it. Organics potentially everywhere. Redox gradients, eh. A smothered Earth with, an, you know, with a water world, I don't see very easily any way of getting redox gradients. On Europa, maybe under the ice you've got hydrothermal vents, but for four and a half billion years, the water that's going to and out those vents is being sucked in, kind of eating its excrement, and the redox gradients are going to go to zero there. So I don't see how you get redox gradients on Europa. If there's life on Europa, it probably came from Mars or Earth, but then it smashes onto the surface, and even this tiniest meteorite hitting the surface of Europa at 60 kilometers a second, you know, you, you have plasma. And I don't know anything that survives a plasma. And it, same thing on, 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 on the extrasolar things. UV screens, very important to stop organic molecules. Mars, as I mentioned, it's good evidence actually from the carbonates in the LH8401. Mars had an ozone screen and oxygen uh, four billion years ago. Earth clearly did not. And these, well, Europe, it's not a problem because it's, and, and these other places, not a problem. Ribose, the only place I see being able to make ribose now is Mars. I don't think it can be formed in an aqueous environment and hydrothermal vents, but it's just not the right chemistry. So I say it's Mars. And Darwin's warm little pond most likely was the puddle on Mars, okay? So, uh, but, but Freeman, here's the proof for you, okay? Trace of our Martian ancestry. <laughs> I rest my case. <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs>